uh, I first got involved in this uh, back in 2018. Uh, I work in our maintenance and operations uh, bureau and I'm in charge of our roadside vegetation management program. Uh, and so it's, uh, you know, obviously a, there's a, a solid connection between what I do and, and uh, the purpose behind all of this. Uh, I wanted to start out this, this morning just uh, uh, inviting anybody that ever wants to venture up to Maine on vacation to come up to Midcoast, Maine and check out Sears Island. Uh, this site uh, has an extensive uh, meadow environment that was planted uh, for the purpose of pollinator habitat uh, and monarch habitat. Uh, you can see a photo over to the right here uh, that has a small tag on one of the butterflies that will be exiting Maine typically uh, in late uh, September through October. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, our lead uh, state entomologist um, with the University of Maine at Orono uh, and I had a conversation about a year ago. Uh, we were talking about this this, this uh, tagging program and he had told me at that point that uh, no uh, monarch butterflies from Maine had ever been found in uh, Mexico. Uh, it's quite a long flight, I suspect. Um, but I wanted to put this up uh, just to show you that uh, we uh, in Maine, th this is a volunteer uh, group that's been uh, managing this site uh, over the years. And there are a lot of people concerned not only about pollinators, but also monarch butterfly. So this is an interesting location. If you're up here in uh, August, late August into September, it's worth a, a, a walk out to the island. You can't drive out there, but you can drive out the causeway, which you can see on the left side. Uh, you can drive out and park uh, and walk out onto the island. So that's kind of fun. Okay, now, um, okay, this is the right slide. I, I wanted to start out by saying that uh, in uh, the summer of 2018, when I first started to get involved in this and, and the folks in the environmental office uh, came to me to get me uh, up to speed, I was quite concerned uh, and as many of us probably were at DOTs across the country with uh, the requirements that were laid out at that time. Uh, so I decided to attend the workshop uh, that was held in Chicago in October of 2018. Um, and I was there with, I believe, either 12 or 13 other DOTs um, across the country. And when we met as a group uh, at that workshop, we all had concerns over the requirements. Um, Maine, many of you may, may know, uh, Maine is 90% forested. And my concern was that we would, would be unable to meet the requirements at that time. So I came back from that meeting um, and, and immediately started discussing uh, you know, what I had learned. Um, we, uh, as a group, uh, environmental office folks and folks in maintenance, we began to talk about our interstate system. Uh, since we uh, knew more about that than our rooted roads, uh, since uh, 2010, uh, we've been contracting the mowing on our interstate system. So we knew um, how many acres we had uh, on the interstate, but we had no idea how many acres uh, we had on our rooted roads. Um, and we we had our, our GIS team look at uh, creating an estimate of, of just how much territory we actually um, had that we would uh, be enrolling on the interstate. So we, will, we worked through that exercise through the winter uh, of 2018-2019. And we found that it was going to take, at that time, we we're looking at 8% uh, of the enrolled lands. So we would have to adopt approximately 900 acres and that included impervious surface at that time. And we didn't have that available uh, on the interstate system. We were close, but we, we had begun to discuss options of uh, alternate year mowing uh, and, and things like that to try to come up with uh, the acreage necessary. I was not a big fan of alternate year mowing uh, only because it does basically destroy 
the habitat every other year. Uh, so I, I was a proponent uh, of, of doing some kind of a survey that would give us some meaningful information uh, about our rooted roads as well. Um, so uh, in early spring of 2019, uh, we laid out a plan to do a statistical analysis of our rooted roads. We were able to get uh, a couple of summer interns from the University of Maine, uh, Margaret Chase Smith program. Uh, they both had backgrounds in GIS and uh, environmental sciences. They were both juniors. Uh, and uh, it turned out to be a, a great experience for them and for us. Uh, and, and they were able to get the survey done. Now, I, I want to point out that if, if uh, any state or utility is interested in doing this type of significant survey work, um, to get really valid uh, statistical data in the range of 90% plus or minus 5%, uh, it requires actually surveying 5% of your total uh, land holding. We weren't able to do that. That would have resulted in uh, 450, uh, I believe 454 one mile plots across the state. And I knew that we wouldn't have time to do that. So we, we shot for about an 80 percent plus or minus five percent but really the goal here was was more to just get a feel for whether or not we had habitat on our rooted roads uh, or not and so um, you know it, it was important to me that we have something that was relatively valid uh, and we wanted to do it once do it right and, and move on in the process of trying to figure out how we we're going to meet the goals so uh, our interns arrived in the summer of 2019. And uh, as part of that survey, the way I laid it out, uh, we decided to eliminate eight feet from the edge of pavement from the calculation of acreage. Uh, we, uh, uh, the first eight feet for us in Maine is, is typically mowed or in our Aristic County area uh, in that Northern region, we actually uh, use herbicides to eliminate invasive plants and reduce uh, the weed pressure, which actually allows for good visibility along our roadside. So four out of our five regions are mowing roadsides every year. Um, and uh, in the northern part of the region, uh, we are using uh, a herbicide treatment, uh, about a six foot wide band along the edge of the pavement to reduce uh, some of the plants that are causing some significant visibility problems for us. Um, so each uh, intern uh, was tasked with determining uh, uh, several things. They worked as a team, by the way, and I should point out that this was uh, the way we designed it. It was a windshield survey. Uh, so uh, we ended up uh, initially with 169 plot locations. Uh, and, and what I wanted to find out was, uh, please, when you're looking at this particular mile plot, uh, and you're looking at both sides of the road. So you're going to go up one side and then down the other. Um, we want to know how much actual total habitat is out there. Um, I mentioned that Maine is quite wooded. Uh, a typical roadside for us uh, consists of a moat portion along the edge of the pavement. And then we get into uh, a relatively unmanaged uh, mid zone before we get to the tree line. That unmanaged mid zone has been uh, treated for uh, hardwood and softwood trees for probably more than 50 years now uh, using a selective approach with uh, herbicides. So we don't blanket our roadsides, we never have. And I, I'll be alluding to the benefit of that later on in the presentation. Uh, but basically, I wanted to know just how much habitat is out there, whether it's existing habitat for pollinators and, and monarch or not, because it, it was gonna be crucial, I thought, to understand how much habitat we had to determine whether or not we were going to be able to meet the goals of the CCAA. Then I wanted also to know uh, how much what I call existing habitat, where we had either 10% nectar source or the presence of milkweed. So in this case, what we did, we used a photo uh, taken every tenth of a mile uh, on either side of the road. So we ended up with 22 photographs uh, for each mile that was surveyed. And then we looked at the percentage of photos showing uh, habitat, either uh, nectar sources or uh, milkweed. Um, and then I finally wanted to have them, uh, during their survey of each of these locations, 
observe uh, the presence of milkweed anywhere in the mile plot, so anywhere on either side of the road, just to get a sense of whether or not we had milkweed out there. So uh, the, the total acres uh, to the right-of-way line uh, was determined prior to actually getting out in the field. Uh, we used that, uh, we looked at every location, and I should say that in Maine we have uh, some roadside, uh, mo most of our roads are easement highways. We don't actually own the land, and so we're going across someone else's land, typically. Um, and when we do this, um, uh, we, we need to understand how, how wide uh, is that zone that we have jurisdiction over uh, under an easement. Uh, so we did the work prior to going out in the field, uh, which I felt was helpful for the interns to understand just where the edge of the right-of-way would be when they were in a particular plot. Uh, and we used that data to come up with an average width for our roadside, uh, for our right-of-way on rooted roads. So rooted roads were split into two types, uh, and I don't know how many other DOTs use a highway corridor priority system, but we have four uh, corridor priority roads, uh, one, two, three, and four. Um, highway corridor one and two are our most traveled roads, uh, and threes and fours are, are our least traveled roads. Um, and we, we ended up looking at 1,788 miles of highway corridor one and two, and uh, 5,344 miles of uh, highway corridor three and four. And this, this is where the surveys were going to take place. So we used ArcMap uh, to uh, split these two groups out. I'm gonna show you some of the maps uh, so you get a better uh, idea of what we did. Uh, a buffer was created around all of the line shapes for each group. Uh, and then that buffer was dissolved. And we used the creative random uh, create random points data management tool to randomize uh, plot locations within each of the two groups. Um, the table of coordinates was then extracted uh, to an Excel spreadsheet for field use and the summer interns were provided with iPads and they used the Google Maps uh, to drive to each coordinate location to start the survey for that particular mile. Um, so data and photos uh, were collected in the field. They were stored on the tablets and uploaded to the iCloud account for the tablet. Uh, so we have all of that data available to us uh, and stored in the cloud. Um, and they were issued uh, a, a Garmin GPS unit. And they used the, the Garmin U, uh, GPS unit to accurately measure uh, the distance along the road to uh, so that every tenth of a mile they would stop and get a photograph. Uh, and they were able to accurately measure the mile that way rather than, you know, using their odometer or any other tool. We, we find that GPS is the best way to, to measure accurately. So interestingly enough, and, and to quite really, quite to my surprise, we found uh, based on the survey that we had enough uh, acreage in, uh, of existing habitat in the unmowed section of roadsides to provide more than the 8% uh, and also cover the need for habitat on the interstate as well, uh, which was a total shock to me. But uh, it, it was pretty interesting that we actually discovered that we had enough habitat out there. So this is a just a map of the state of Maine uh, that was generated in ArcMap showing all of the coordinate locations. Um, I, I alluded to, but I forgot to mention that uh, 11 uh, of the 169 uh, plots we ended up throwing out because in, in those cases we had what we call prescriptive easement uh, in Maine and we had actually no authority to do any work along the side of the road. On prescriptive easements there's no county layout that would have been uh, done back in the 1800s or early 1900s before most roads in Maine were turned over to the state highway department in I believe 1929, and uh, uh, so we had no layouts, no survey done on, on these prescriptive easements. A lot of them actually exist along the coast on many of the peninsulas that are, head out into the ocean in Maine. And so we actually have no jurisdiction uh, unless we put in a ditch or a drainage easement or something like that 
that we actually have a written document on file with a landowner at some point where we set up a, uh, an easement in perpetuity. Uh, so we threw those out because uh, honestly, we can't do anything to that property uh, without landowner permission. So we ended up, I believe it was a count of uh, over 140 plots, but this shows you all the plots. I wanna point out at this time also, this part of Maine up here in the Northern section, this is all paper company land, privately owned land. There are no paved highways. This is also right in this area where Baxter State Park uh, is. And we, we have recently designated a national monument, uh, land donated adjacent to Baxter State Park. So this is all wild land up here. And then down east, this whole section here, uh, we have no state roads because this is also privately owned paper company land. So you can see that um, we have no plots in these areas. So I just wanted to, this is a screenshot just to point out the uh, Create Random Points tool in ArcMap. Uh, it works very well. It's very easy to use. Um, and uh, as long as you uh, create points in uh, polygons, in, in the case, what we did was we had all the polygons around the, uh, the roads and then we dissolved those. And then you can use this tool to create a random set of points. This shows the Highway Corridor 1 and 2 roads. These are the primary roads in Maine, our major and minor arterials and major collector roads uh, in Maine that carry most of the traffic on a daily basis. So these have the highest uh, annual average daily traffic count. Um, and uh, these are the plots that were uh, established along those roads. So each one of these plots was a mile long uh, and it was a windshield survey. Just a reminder to mute yourself if we're getting some background noise. Okay, go ahead, Bob, sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, these are our Highway Corridor 3 and 4 roads. There's quite a few more of them. These are the roads that bring uh, people to our major collectors. And these are the plots that were laid out uh, on our uh, Highway Corridor 3 and 4 roads. It, it was really uh, impressive to me uh, that the interns uh, worked diligently at the, at the work. Uh, they're only paid $12 an hour. They can only work up to uh, a certain amount of time. Uh, and they really made an effort. And they were able to get the survey work done, uh, which was very impressive. One of our interns left a week early um, and I was able to give my assistance to the other intern uh, to finish up work in the Augusta area. So we, we, we tried to get them out to the outer edges of the state first. They worked down east, they stayed overnight and did everything in this area for both one and two and three and four. They stayed overnight up in the Arista County area and they were able to coordinate their work for this part of the state and not have to stay overnight. But it was a very impressive um, and, and I'm, I'm very proud of the work they did for us. So why do we have enough habitat in Maine? Uh, I came to work for Maine DOT in 2000, and I had an extensive background in integrated vegetation management prior to taking this job. Um, I uh, was able to uh, move our spray program. We had just started using contractors in 1997, and uh, by 2000, that was well in place. And we did not have too many Maine DOT crews doing roadside brush control. 95% of the spray activity for Maine DOT is now done by contractors. And I monitored the amount of herbicide being put out on our roadsides uh, by looking at the water use each year. So this, this chart actually starts in 2006 and goes through 2019. And it's showing a downward trend. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with spray programs, we, um, we try to achieve 100 gallons per acre, no matter what we're using for herbicides. So it's easy to use our water usage since it's uh, comparative across all of our herbicide applications for brush control. Um, in 2004, uh, based on work um, I had been analyzing from 2000 through 2004, I decided that we should go to an every other year uh, approach with our herbicide applications. So, Four out of our five regions adopted that uh, approach. And uh, our Western region 
uh, has continued to spray every year. Uh, they do their entire 1,200 miles every year with a contractor. Um, you can notice a dip here in 2007 and then a, a, a spike uh, in 2008. Two thousand and seven, when they took the entire uh, one hundred and sixty thousand dollar a year budget for spraying and uh, put in a strut or a concrete uh, box bridge, um, and so I lost the budget that year. We didn't spray, and so the following season in two thousand eight, you can see the spike because of the uh, extra amount of spraying that was done. But on average, this trend line shows a downward trend. Uh, representing approximately 30% reduction in our use of herbicide between 2006 and 2019. And I, I mentioned earlier that our program has always been selective. We just target uh, hardwood and softwood trees. And in Maine, pesticide regulations require us to target trees, uh, the softwood trees less than uh, three feet in height and hardwood trees less than six feet in height. So it's a very targeted program. We, uh, it's really old fashioned in many respects. We, our contractors are typically riding in a one ton. There, there's a spray applicator on the back of the truck and they're, they're literally just, okay, there's a tree, spray it. They move along, there's a tree, spray it. Uh, since our concern for pollinators uh, has come along, we've also educated our applicators to try to avoid uh, spraying any nectar sources. And so this continued approach of selective herbicide application has allowed our roadsides to develop into uh, areas that are actually quite beneficial for pollinators. Um, we did a survey of our roadsides, uh, a plant survey that was done by our natural areas program botanists back in 2015 and 16. And uh, in 2017, uh, Frank Drummond uh, and an associate from the University of Maine in Orono uh, did a pollinator study on our system. Um, and uh, the results of that were quite interesting. A very basic uh, understanding that the more nectar sources you have, the more pollinators visit uh, roadsides. So, uh, and that's going to be the case with Monarch as well. So, I just want to end here by showing you a typical roadside environment in Maine. Uh, if you look across the road, uh, up in this area by this tractor trailer, you can see our mowing program is just mowing the edge of the road. And beyond that, uh, we, we don't really have any other management practice other than spraying for the small trees. This side is more um, noteworthy in that we have quite a few nectar sources. I believe I took this picture in August. So we, we have several species of uh, goldenrod, early goldenrod up here in the front and I'm not sure what this species is but we have a lot of goldenrod in the state uh, and we also you know obviously for those of you who know this is purple loosestrife uh, so we have a, a number of invasive plants we have wild carrot or uh, queen anne's lace here in the foreground uh, outside clover this is bird's foot trefoil out here this yellow low legume which used to be in our roadside seed mixes 40 and 50 years ago uh, but I want to note that right here in the front, we have a little patch of monarch, um, I'm sorry, milkweed, common milkweed, and it's really not noticeable back here, but this, this is a patch of milkweed back here as well. The one thing that's absent from this 20 foot zone are trees, and that's because of our selective approach to controlling trees, which are our number one enemy in Maine uh, for roadside. So trees uh, inhibit visibility. Uh, they impede drainage of water off the road. Uh, they block sunlight, so making icing an issue in the winter. Uh, they, are, they become fixed deadly objects. So this has been our approach in Maine uh, over the years. So we're not trying to make this a nice pristine golf course uh, experience for the driver along the road. We actually get quite a few comments, uh, positive comments about how much our roadsides uh, are full of uh, flowering plants. Uh, and this is the case across the state. And as I said, our survey, uh, which I feel, uh, even though it was uh, roughly 80 to 90 percent um, valid, I think it did prove to us that we have uh, enough habitat. And of course, now that some changes have taken place, taking out impervious surface, for example, 
we actually are going to be able to commit to more than the 8% required adopted acres. Um, and we, we haven't really settled on exactly what that number is. We went out because of COVID, we've been working remotely, and I, we do need to get back together as a group and, and work out those numbers. Uh, but Eric Ham and I have, have been con consulting quite a bit uh, over the, the course of the last year and a half, and uh, uh, I think we're hopeful that uh, we're gonna be able to make an impact. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm done if there's any questions. Great, um, and thank you so much, Bob. Um, I just saw a question chatted in here. Um, do you have a standard pollinator seed mix or are your roadsides naturally reseeding? Uh, yes, uh, that's a great question. We actually are working on seed mixes right now for upland riparian and wetland environments for the environmental office. One of our transportation landscape architects and myself have been charged with doing that. Um, I got through the exercise recently of coming up with the plants, the, the wildflower uh, species that would work in those environments. And we're, we're going to be going out to seed suppliers to see uh, if they can help us to create uh, seed mixes based on those plant lists. Um, we do not have that currently. However, we have used our special seeding mix uh, provision uh, in our standard specifications last year. Um, I started to experiment. We had opened up about 80 acres on our interstate system, and last fall I seeded it to uh, early goldenrod, uh, black eyed Susan, uh, common milkweed, uh, and uh, uh, New England aster. Uh, just as an experiment to see how well they would establish from a hydro seeding uh, approach. And, and so that uh, I'm actually going to be going out tomorrow to review to see if anything's starting to come up. Uh, we don't have currently special seed mixes, but I expect that those will be coming uh, soon. So a lot of what you see in this photograph is actually all of it is, is naturally occurring. Um, I did a presentation at the Northeast Wildlife uh, in Transportation Conference in 2018. It, the focus was on pollinators in roadside environments. So I was asked to speak. The one thing I, I said at that time was if we leave it alone, they'll come home. Uh, we, we do know from experience that mowing uh, eliminates a lot of our native uh, wildflowers. They, they don't tolerate mowing very well at all. But if we can leave the habitat alone, they come back. And so, you know, my approach has always been to minimally manage the roadside environment in Maine. Uh, for our transportation needs, which is primarily visibility and winter snow storage and getting sunlight on the road. So our program, we spend a great deal of money on tree removal uh, and controlling trees, probably close to a million dollars a year, including our herbicide uh, program, which 95% uh, of that is, is uh, dedicated to tree control. Uh, but because that's selective, um, we, we see a lot of roadside habitat as represented in this photograph, uh, where we have uh, native plants, non-native plants, and some invasives, uh, but uh, it's naturally occurring. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments for Bob? I should say, uh, once we get those seed mixes uh, established, we're not going to be able to put them in our standard specifications uh, until, uh, I believe, 2024. Uh, but uh, please feel free to contact me um, at uh, Maine DOT. Uh, and if we do have those uh, seed mixes established, uh, they should be useful throughout uh, New England uh, and the upper Midwest uh, as well. Uh, it did take quite a bit of uh, work researching, working with um, experts uh, in the field to develop the list. And now we, we need to actually give that to seed suppliers and, and find out what they can provide us and come up with some seed mixes uh, that actually will be standardized for us moving forward. 